This is the R Podcast, Episode 4, Data Structures, an Introduction. Welcome back to the R Podcast. My name is Eric Nance, and I'm the host of this podcast. And for those of you who have listened since episode one, welcome back. And for those of you new, well, welcome to the podcast, and I hope you enjoy what you hear. Today, we are going to discuss data structures and provide a brief introduction to this concept because this is arguably one of the most important concepts to understand as you start to gain more experience with R. So first I wanted to uh, discuss some housekeeping items. First of which is, for those of you who listened to episode three, that was also the first episode in which we had an accompanying screencast with the episode. And I wanted to thank everyone who provided feedback on that, which I'll get to in a little bit here. And just one note personally, it um, ended up being a lot longer than I anticipated and also there were a couple of technical issues with that, and one of the technical issues just with the episode in general was the audio was not quite the way I expected. So what happened was in between some reboots of my machine, somehow the audio settings that I configured so nicely in the first couple of episodes got a little out of whack. So now they're sounding hopefully a lot better this time. And um, another update is that we are now on Google+. Plus. So for those of you who haven't heard about this, Google is now using this uh, new um, feature called Google+. Plus. I'm not, not sure if it's a direct competitor to Facebook or whatever, but anyway, it sounds like a pretty nice way to get the word out for the podcast in general. So now I've set up a little site on Google+, Plus dedicated to the R podcast. I have a link available on the home page, which of course is www.r-podcast.org, you'll see a link to the Google Plus page on the right-hand margin. And there is also a short link to the URL because by default, Google Plus has what I would consider very long and kind of unwieldy URLs to type in yourself. But there was a service that let me get what was called a short URL so that short URL, which I'll put in the show notes, is simply goplus.us dash or slash our podcast. So once again, I'll have that link in the show notes as well if you're interested. A couple other updates, not really for this site in itself, but more in the R community, is that I've come across a couple new sites that are actually also offering various uh, screencasts about using R as well. The first one I discovered recently is called R Tutorials, and that's found at www.tutorials.com, and that's spelled T W O T O R I A L S.com. And I've had a chance to look at the first few episodes, and I think the purpose of the site is giving short and very short, I would say around one to two minutes in length little tutorials on the basics of R. And I must say, the author is off to a pretty promising start. And judging by the screencast that I viewed, he's demonstrating how to use R and the concepts using the default R Windows GUI so far. So I'm not sure if he's gonna stick with that or he's gonna try doing other things. But like I said, it's off to a pretty promising start and I think it's a pretty nice resource. Another site, which isn't really dedicated to R specifically, but more to statistics, has a very uh, funny name called Stats Make Me Cry, which um, for those of you who have actually taught statistics before, maybe in a graduate school, you probably have had students in the past that are not so happy with statistics. But anyway, I, of course, I'm a big fan of it, given I'm making a living off it. But anyway, this site has a few screencasts about R and it looks like he's predominantly using R on the Macintosh platform. 
and he's done a couple of various uh, tutorials so far, and it's actually pretty nice and pretty good quality too. And um, like I said, it looks like he's using the Mac to record the screencast, and yeah, pretty good job so far, so I'll be keeping an eye on that as well. And I'll put links to both of these sites in the show notes for today's episode as well. So now getting those items out of the way, I'd like to get to our listener feedback. Message for you, son. So our first piece of listener feedback comes from Kevin. Kevin writes, Hey, new to R, new to statistics. Loving your podcast slash screencast. You are doing a great job. I wanted to learn R and stats for a while, and now I am because of you. Thanks. Some feedback. I'm having a hard time seeing your screencast. Even in full screen, the text is a little small and hard to follow. I don't know what software you're using to make your screencast, but is there a zoom function? So you could zoom in on only the active panel in our studio? That would be helpful. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. And I I replied back to Kevin directly recently. And I must say, it's really nice to hear feedback from new listeners who are actually now taking up R and statistics in general. And having this podcast be a part of that is really exciting. So hopefully Kevin will keep tuning in. But in terms of his feedback about the screencast, when I recorded the screencast, I thought I'd had a solution in place to be able to zoom in on certain portions. And at the time I recorded, it didn't work. Well, now after it's been released and I've done some additional testing, I think I found the solution after all. So when I do another screencast in the near future, I'll be using that zoom feature, which hopefully will make the reading of the text a little more legible because I do acknowledge it was a bit small when you even when you play the screen on full uh, when you play the screencast on full screen. So our next piece of feedback comes from Julian. Julian writes, Hi, I've been listening to your podcast and I downloaded the VLC player to view the screencast. However, I get no video feed, just a green screen. Is there a special plugin or anything of that nature necessary? Regards, Julian. P.S. I love the podcast so far. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Julian. And, of course, thank you for the encouraging words as well. I hope that you'll enjoy the future episodes going forward. So regarding your feedback on the VLC player, it's very interesting in which I attested the videos using the machine I use to record the, the screencast on with VLC, and it played just fine. But in retrospect, now I've given your feedback, I did a little more digging, and it turns out there are some bugs with playing that specific format of the video file in VLC, and I didn't know that at the time. So what I'm going to do is for the next screencast, and even for this screencast, if I can find a solution, I'm going to go ahead and find a way to export that to an additional format that hopefully would be more playable to users of all types of operating systems. And I can't remember if I mentioned it in the beginning of this um, series of podcasts, but I'm using a version of Linux to record everything here. And there are some times when things will work nicely here, but it may not play so nicely on other operating systems. So like I said... I'm going to check into that, but once again, thank you very much for the feedback. So that about covers the listener feedback for today's episode. So now we're going to get to our main topic, data structures, an introduction. So today's topic is talking about data structures, and I wanted to start here as far as kind of diving into the concepts of R because this is really, in essence, the very ground layer of this foundation we're building, uh, building up the skills of you know learning R and statistical computing with R in general. Because these data structures I'm about to talk about don't just apply to the data you're actually going to analyze, but it also applies to statistical output generated from, say, statistical models in R as an example. Unlike some other stat computing software, what R does is it uses these same type of objects in both the data to be analyzed 
and also the results you get from data analysis. For example, say a linear model, for example, you know, it's like a regression model for those of you unfamiliar, or even some other, even like categorical analysis or other, other things of that nature, which obviously we'll be talking about more in later episodes. But if we really set this foundation about these different objects, you know, you know, then interacting with not only the data itself, but also the results from the data will become a lot easier because you'll have, a, in essence, a reference point to use when you explore these different objects that R is giving you. So the first type of data structure we're going to talk about is called vectors. And actually, for those of you who have seen episode three or also listened to that, we had a demonstration of creating basic vectors in that script. And before I go further, all the concepts I'm going to talk about today, I will have an additional R script online via our GitHub page and that you can download that and take a look for yourself and actually run it yourself and get the same results I'm about to talk about. So anyway, back to vectors. Vectors are simply, in essence, these one-dimensional collection of what are called elements of the same type. And these elements are, and like I said, these elements inside need to be the same actual type. So for example, you'll see in the R script for today's episode, I've created a simple vector of GPA scores, for example. And as we know, these scores are all numeric in nature. So the way, as you, the way to create a vector in R is very simple. You just use that function called C, which is, I believe, short for concatenate. But anyway, you just simply put those elements you want in that vector separated by a comma inside that function, and then you have it. So there are, of course, different types of vectors. And like I mentioned in this example, you can have a numeric vector, which is probably the most common when it comes to dealing with data. But also it's important to know that you can have vectors of character values as well. So if you wanted to create one like that, you would simply put quotes around those different elements inside. And so those are really the, the kind of the two basic ones. But then in addition to that, there's also kind of a special type of vector that actually combines kind of the features of both of these, and that's called a factor. So what a factor is, um, it actually is uh, kind of linking to the concept of categorical data, if you will, in, in statistical you know, terminology, in which this uh, factor could be linked to, say, a variable that's used to describe say different groups of data or different types of data. So getting back to this example about GPA scores, we could have a factor that describes what grade level this particular, uh, particular GPA, GPA score came from. And if you're thinking of say high school grade levels in the United States here, that could correspond to say freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. So What's interesting is that you could, in essence, just define a character vector of those, of those different levels, and that would be acceptable in most circumstances. But what's interesting about R is that if you want to do any, say, statistical modeling that incorporates that grouping feature of, say, gray levels in an analysis of those GPA scores, most of the built-in functions in R are going to require that character variable, that categorical variable of grade level to be in what's called a factor. So it's quite easy to actually create a factor from an existing character vector where you simply just use the factor function. And the factor function will have some different arguments depending on what customizations you need. So by default, when you create a factor, it'll assume that the different levels of the grouping variable, for example, are all in that factor, that character vector that you're supplying to it. So for example, you'll see in the script that I have a simple character vector of these grade levels. And just by the way I created it, 
there are also there are all four of those grade levels in that character vector so when I just want to create a factor from that I just use the factor function and then supply that object corresponding to that character variable that character vector if you will of those grade levels now on the surface it may not see, be, seem obvious what difference a factor is from say that character variable itself that I started with. Well what's interesting is that behind the scenes in R, R actually assigns different numeric values to these levels although on most of the time the user i.e. you or me will not see that obviously when we just look at those factor vectors. But behind the scenes this is important because R is going to use that kind of numeric assigning information to the factor as it computes say a statistical model that incorporates that categorical data for example as say a grouping variable of interest or maybe another type of variable itself. So what's interesting is that factors are really greatly important in terms of doing any kind of modeling or analysis in general with R when you have a, a vector of character values that's going to describe some kind of grouping for example. So it's important to know that you can create factors quite easily with a existing character vector. And, for ex and what's nice is when you create the factor there in the factor function there's an argument called levels in which if the data you're supplying to it did not actually contain all the possible levels of that factor you could simply use the levels argument and then define in like a simple character vector the different levels that the data corresponds to so for example if I only had three of the grade levels in my character vector that I started with and then create a factor from that and I knew that obviously the other grade level that was missing should be a part of that especially if I add new data later on then I would use that levels argument and make sure I had all four grade levels incorporated into that that, argu that uh, value for that argument. So it's important to know that even though your data may not have all the levels in it just by the nature of the data you can still define all the possible levels via that factor function. And so next that kind of covers what I want to talk about with vectors. Like I said they're all this kind of one dimensional row if you will of data which can be numeric or character format and then factor is kind of this special type of vector in which it's really used for say categorical data that should be incorporated into some kind of statistical model or even the processing of data in general. There's a lot more about vectors I haven't touched on here specifically and there are even some different types such as corresponding to dates and times which I'll probably address probably later in, in future episodes. So the next type of data structure I wanted to talk about is a matrix. For matrix is simply you know a two-dimensional representation of data in which you have rows and columns and so really in R a matrix actually behind the scenes is really a special type of vector which again will not be as obvious if you're just exploring matrices in R itself but behind the scenes there are actually some specific features of a matrix object in R that actually come from a vector but just give some additional features to it. So the way you create a matrix in R is pretty simple in which let's say you have a vector of say those GPA scores that we created previously. All you need to do is just use the matrix function and then supply as the first argument that vector of numbers or character variable that character values if, if it's that way and then you can supply some additional arguments corresponding to the number of rows that would be called n row and then likewise you could specify the number of columns as well although 
you really just need one or the other. You don't actually need both, but if you want to use both, that's fine too. And then there's an argument called by row, which can take either a true or false uh, a designation in which it decides if to fill the matrix with those numbers you supplied into it, or that vector, if you will, going by row. So it would say, start with row one and take however many values in that vector correspond to that row, then go to the next row, and then go to the next row. That would be corresponding to by row equal true. If by row equal false, which I believe is the default, it'll actually fill all the values in the matrix by column. So it'll fill column one first, for example, and then go to column two. So a matrix, there's one specific caveat to matrices that I want to mention now is that all of the elements inside a matrix need to be the same type or the same mode, if you will. And that's just like what I was saying about a vector in which the elements must be the same type. If you ever tried to mix the two, I think by default in a vector, it would default to a character if you tried to mix like a numeric, some numeric elements and some character elements inside that. So that's in general a bad idea. Definitely keep those elements of the same type. So the same thing corresponds to matrices as well. So the matrix object, after you created a, mat you know, a matrix via the matrix function, you can assign some certain attributes to it should you wish. And some of those attributes include naming the rows of a matrix as well as naming the columns as well. This is obviously an optional step, but depending on what your needs are, you may want to do that. So in the example script I have online, I've also given some row and column names to this GPA matrix, if you will. And those just can simply be character vectors corresponding to the number of rows and the number of columns that you have in the data. So I just arbitrarily named the row names as like R1 through R8. And then the column names I just named as mid and end corresponding to say if those GPAs were from the middle of the semester or the end of the semester. So that was like the columns in the matrix, if you will. So a matrix... As I mentioned, it actually is a special version of a vector. And the reason I say that is that there are certain attributes that a, a vector doesn't have that a matrix actually has. And those attributes by default are simply the number of rows and the number of columns in that matrix. And you can actually extract those features of a matrix using a few different functions. You could use the function called dim and supply then the name of the matrix and then you'll get simply a two uh two um vector or a two um, let me try that again you'll get a couple numbers from that and you'll get the number of rows and the number of columns just outputted in the console and then if you just wanted the number of rows you would just use a function called n row and likewise for the number of columns you could just use a function called n cow that's N-C-O-L. And then let's say you did have names for the matrix uh, rows and columns. You could get those out using a function called dim names. And then that was simply output in the R console, just that those different row and column names into, into the output. So that might be useful if you're writing some, say, general purpose code, if you will which we haven't really touched on yet, but that will be an important later on. So those, those two types of objects, vectors and matrices, are definitely somewhat related because actually, like I said, a matrix is a special type of vector after all. But now I want to get to a more general type of structure for data structures, and that's called a list. A list is probably the most flexible structure as far as data structures are concerned in R. Because what a list simply is, it's simply a collection of different types of structures in R. Well, let me, let me clarify that. You could in a list just put the same type of objects in that list, but you don't have to. In other words, you could have a list that is simply a collection of different numeric vectors. 
Or you could have a list that's a collection of different types of data structures in general. So using an example, I could create a list of these different GPA type objects that I've created thus far and put that in this new list. I could call it gpa.list. And all you do to create a list is use the list function. And the arguments in that list function are simply the different objects you want as a part of that list. So I can create a list that actually has that numeric vector of GPA scores. It could also have that matrix of GPA scores I just created. And also those two different vectors corresponding to the grade levels one of which is that character version of that grade level uh, vector, and another could be that factor version of that grade level fact grade level vector. And so this is this this flexibility. I cannot um, emphasize enough how important this is because what you'll notice is that when we get to running, say, some basic statistical modeling, such as say regression modeling the types of results that R will give us after using those kind of functions are most likely going to be returned in a list format. The reason this is so important is because then R can put all the different results from, say, a regression output, maybe corresponding to, for example, a set of predicted values, if um, a set of the inferences of different coefficients in a model. It could even return um, uh, some residuals as well. But what's interesting is that all these different parts of those results are actually different types of data structures. But by using a list, R can basically put all this together into one, one global object, if you will. And then as a user, you can then take bits and parts of that list for further processing should you wish. So... This is a very important structure to know because it's kind of like this all this all purpose toolbox, if you will, of different types of data, and they don't necessarily have to have the same features. So going back to creating a list, like I said, you can just supply the objects in that list function. And then if you wanted to say name those different objects in a list, you could do this a couple different ways where you could actually, after you created this list object, you could use a function called names and then put in that, that object corresponding to your list and then supply and, and then assign to that a simple character vector corresponding to the different names you want for those objects. You could also do this when you define the list itself because what you can do is in that list function, you could simply give a name that you want for a particular object and use a notation of like that particular name and then the equal sign and then that type of that actual object you want as part of that name. So I have examples of both of these in the R script where I've created some arbitrary names to those objects after the fact when I created the list and also I, I've used the way of when defining that list the first time of supplying those names right away into the list function. Another, part of the last points I'll make about list is that you can extract certain parts of a list using actually some different kind of notation than what we're used to from say vectors and matrices. So going back a little bit, if you wanted to get say the first element of a vector you could simply put the name of that vector and then put a bracket and then put in like that, that position of the element you want to extract from. So for example, if I wanted to extract the first element of that vector of GPA scores, I just put bracket one close bracket after the name of that GPA object, then I'll get the first element. Well, for a list, if you want to extract the first object of that list, you actually use double brackets, which is just more about the structures of lists themselves, but it's just like in a vector of extracting the first element of a vector. 
in a, in a list, you want to extract the first object of a list, you put double brackets one and then close double brackets. But here's what's really interesting is that if you went ahead and named those elements of a list, all you need to do is you could just type the name of that list itself, then put a dollar sign afterwards, and then the name of that object you want to extract. So for example, if I have a part of the list called score.vec, and I call this list gpa.list, I can just type gpa.list, dollar sign, score.vec, and then when I run that, I get that, that object of the scores that I supplied into it printed in the R console. So that, that type of extracting of different objects in a list is very important because that's gonna tie nicely into the last data structure we talk about today. And there are actually some other ways of doing that same thing using again that double bracket notation, but instead of putting a number, you could put in quotes the name of that object you want to extract from. So that's, so I think the, the main point I want to emphasize about lists is that they are extremely flexible and also extremely important and in, in definitely in getting statistical results from say regression type models, but it's not just that. In a lot of statistical procedures in R, it'll return a list as like the type of results you can parse for future processing. So I'm gonna, the last data structure I wanna talk about today is called a data frame. So a data frame, the reason I saved this for last is that it combines features of all the objects or many of the objects or data structures that I've talked about previously. A data frame is in essence a two-dimensional uh, summary of actual data where you have rows and then you have columns. We tend to think of rows as like the different observations in a data set and the columns corresponding to say the different variables in a data set. So right away, that's a feature that's similar to matrices that we talked about previously. But it also has features that are closely linked with a list because these different columns in the data frame don't need to be the same type of column. In other words, a data frame can be a mix of say numeric data, for example, those GPA scores, but also say a character vector of like, for example, those grade levels, also that factor of grade levels could be put right in there too without a problem. So, but the one caveat is that these vectors or these different vectors that are corresponding to the variables in a data frame, they need to have the same number of elements. Otherwise you might have some problems with the data frame. So, and to create a data frame out of say different objects you've already created, all you need to do is use the data.frame uh, function. And for example, if I want a data frame with all those types of objects corresponding to the GPA scores and those different representations of grade levels, I just supply those, those object names as the arguments in the data.frame function call. And then I'll have, after that, a new object corresponding to what's called a data frame. There are some really interesting features about a data frame that kind of take bits and pieces from the different data structures we just talked about. You can name the, the variables or the columns in the data frame, much like how you can name elements of a list or even the element or even the rows of a, or I should say the columns of a matrix. To do that, you would, there are a few different ways. The way I've ended up doing a lot is using what's called the names function, which we used already in that, that list uh, example but you can do the same thing with the data frame. So notice how you can take concepts from one data structure and apply it to a data frame here. So in the code that I have online, I have different ways of assigning names to the, the variables inside a data frame. And like, like I mentioned before, when I say variables in a data frame, I'm simply saying the columns inside a data frame. That's kind of, you know, that's the equivalent statement. And so 
There are also, you can extract certain parts of a data frame using a lot of different ways. For the purposes of today's episode, I'll just tell you that you can extract el uh, different elements or different sets of elements from a data frame using similar notation as what you would use in say, getting elements from a matrix or also getting elements from a list. They're all equivalent. So for example, let's say my first column in the data frame is that, that numeric GPA score column that we supplied into it. If I want to just extract that particular column, I have a few different ways of doing that. Using matrix type notation, I could put the name of the data frame I created, then put a bracket, comma, one, and then close bracket, and what that's saying is like how you would extract the first column of a matrix, that's how you would ex could extract the first column of a data frame. But if you've already named the data frame columns, which actually by default R will give you names of each column corresponding to the names of the objects that were fed into it, then all you need to do is type the name of the data frame a dollar sign and then the name of that column you want to extract. So if I had named that first column scores, I could just type the name of the data frame, in this case, gpa.data, dollar sign scores, and then I get that first column of the data frame, just like I got with that matrix type notation. If you want to extract specific observations from the data frame, again, you can use a simple matrix type indexing where you could use a bracket and then put the the row that you want to extract, comma, and then the column you want to extract. So that's just taking, for example, if I want the element in row two, column three of the data frame, I would just type two, comma, three in those brackets and then I would get that particular element. And actually the advantage of data frames is that given that these variables have names, you can use a lot of what's called logical kind of, con or I should say, conditional processing to extract certain rows and columns or certain rows that meet a certain criteria and then just apply then the columns you want with that. That's a, definitely a topic that I'll be talking about in the very near future because that feeds into the overall kind of data management uh, procedures and functions that are available in R that will be definitely important to kind of get a get a good understanding of as we deal with data a lot more in future episodes. And there are some other useful functions as well for data frames, a lot such as just like with a matrix, you can get the number of rows and the number of columns using those n row and n cow functions as well. And likewise, you could return the names of a data frame. When I say names, I mean the names of the variables simply using that names function again and just supplying the object corresponding to your data frame. I use this a lot because there are times where if I've imported a data, a data uh, object, which we'll be talking about again in future episodes, and I want to change the names, well, I first want to see what the names actually were. So I often use that names function to just quickly print out what the names of that data frame are. And then if I need to, I can go ahead and reassign different names, just like what I, what I talked about earlier, where after the fact, you can name the different variables in a data frame, likewise naming the different L objects in a list using that names function. It's very handy to use. So what's interesting is that now with all those data structures we talked about, you can really extract some really interesting kind of features if you want to know more about how R views these different data structures. There are a lot of very neat functions to kind of get at behind the scenes how R is treating these different data structures. Those functions include class, str, mode, etc. Those are like the big three that I use a lot. And if you run those on the different objects we talked about today, or I should say the different data structures, you'll see then that there are different classes to these different data structures. And that's important because 
the class of an object in R is what helped determine how the what are called these general purpose functions or what they call generic functions how they give you output based on the type of or class of object that's fed into it and that will be covered again in future episodes but to give you a preview there's a nice function called summary for example well if you supply a numeric vector in summary you'll get a slightly different result than if you supply a data frame in the summary function. So that, that this kind of object-oriented structure of R, where features are determined based on different classes as far as how functions interact with these objects, is a very important concept that we'll be utilizing time and time again as we start actually analyzing data and also getting more detail on analysis results based on analyzing these data. So that about covers what I wanted to talk about in today's episode. As you see, there's, there's definitely a lot more information that we could cover about data structures, and we will, obviously, in future episodes. But think of these four types of data structures as the different types of components of building a house, for example, or even building that foundation of a house. If you have all these, you'll be able to deal with basically anything that R will throw at you, or you'll be able to interact with R using principles based on these different data structures. So it's hugely important as we start getting this kind of baseline knowledge of how R works, of getting a good handle on these different data structures. And one, one thing to close on the main topic is, You'll see, obviously, in my R script, I've used, utilized these different functions and different ways of exploring these data structures. But for those of you who are wondering, well, how do I get started in actually knowing what those are? Well, there's a really handy uh, cheat sheet, if you will, which actually has been in existence for quite a few years, but it actually has a lot of these important functions incorporated into the cheat sheet in a very easy-to-use format. And so this cheat sheet has been called the R reference card, and it can be found actually on that, what's on the rseq.org site that I mentioned back in, I believe, episode one or two, or, and which is basically a Google version of finding anything to do with R. But on their home site of rseq.org, you'll see under that search box, you'll see a few different hyperlinks at the bottom. Well, there's one hyperlink called ref card, which then directly links to this PDF of the cheat sheet I'm referring to. And there are many, many useful functions part of this cheat sheet. And what I would recommend if you're beginning to use R and you kind of want to start exploring how these different functions work, I would go ahead and download and possibly print off that, that cheat sheet and have that right next to you as you start to try out different things. For example, in the code I'm posting on GitHub or even trying out different code yourself via those nice tutorial sites that I've linked to in the, in the reference section of the site. So it's really, it's a, I actually had that, I started with that way back, oh gosh, probably at least four or five years ago. And to this day, there are times where I just simply click on that PDF again I'll refresh my memory on something because it's just such a handy little reference to have because it's so many different functions in R, it can be difficult to always remember all of them. But this is really a nice way of doing that. So that, that wraps up what I wanted to talk about with the main topic. So with that, I think it's time to wrap up this episode. So really the major objective of this episode was to talk about or introduce these different data structures because they're so fundamental in not only the data that we use for analysis, but also the results that we get from analysis as well. And so in this kind of series about data that we're embarking on now, we'll be talking about different concepts corresponding to these data structures. As I mentioned, managing data and the data of return in these objects is a very important topic, which we'll be discussing shortly as well as, of course, the concept of importing data into R. 
because obviously it's not feasible to always create this data from scratch if we can already have a data file that has the data we need. So we'll be definitely talking about how to import data from various formats into R itself so that we can start analyzing the data. In closing, I'd like to mention, please uh, stay subscribed to the podcast via our RSS feeds on the home site. As, and if you're listening via iTunes, definitely please stay subscribed via iTunes as well. Uh, one feature that I haven't mentioned much previously is that we also have a Twitter account in which we give show updates. Our Twitter handle is at the RCast, and we'll have different posts corresponding to updates to the site or postings of new episodes on that account. And as I mentioned earlier, we also are on Google Plus as well. So if you're on that as well, definitely check us out. I'd be happy to interact with all of you via that as well. And speaking of interaction, as always, I definitely appreciate all the listener feedback I've been getting. And I wanted to remind everyone again that we also have capabilities of providing audio feedback as well. You can use the voicemail line at plus one two six nine eight four nine nine seven eight zero and leave us a message via the Google voicemail feature. Or if you want, you can record your own audio comment using your own uh, hardware setup and then send your audio comment, say as an MP3 or other audio format via email to thercast at gmail.com. I'm really enjoying the interaction I'm having with all of you, and I definitely look forward to hopefully receiving some nice audio comments in the future as well. So with that, we're, this has been Episode 4 of the R Podcast, and until next time... End of line.